We come to a, uh, what is certainly a unique Sunday. There is uh, intended, it certainly should be there every Sunday, but as we come to the Lord's Supper today, there is a unique both joy and seriousness that marks our time of worship this morning. So this Sunday is unique for that, that as often as we do this, it's one of those Sundays we do this, we are going to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Jesus. Uh, It has since yesterday become a unique Sunday because of events in this world of grave nature that are taking place in the country of Israel. And uh, there is a heaviness, uh, especially as students of Scripture realizing there is a little added weight to what is going on there on top of the fact that uh, for some, we know some who are over there trying to get home. There is a heaviness. And in the midst of all that, uh, I just need to prepare you, and I I, I hate to do this emotionally, it's a big swing over, but it's also a unique Sunday because you don't normally go to church on a Sunday where your pastor's wife is due any moment now. To have a baby. And so I am telling you that to tell you and to prepare you. There is a plan. My phone is on, and Bethany has started uh, some latent parts of labor this weekend. So it's not like if I get a phone call, I'm saying is if this phone lights up and it's my wife or my mother in law, I'm going to call Matt Downing up. I'm going to call our musicians up. We're going to enter into the invitation, and Matt and his pastoral staff will lead you on, and I'll see you when I see you next. Okay? <laughs> So I just want to give you that proviso. That is not a normal Sunday uh, for for most, but I need to give you that proviso that that's what's going on. Now, uh, we have been walking through the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. We've used the tagline, you can see it on the screen, overcomers, because at the end of every one of those letters, there is a statement made by Jesus urging and imploring and exhorting his church not to give in, not to fall prey, not to let up, but to overcome. And to the ones who overcome, and, he, and he, he, he reminds us of the incredible weight of reward that, that he delights to give his children who overcome. Now, because today's Lord's Supper, there is a unique connection between what we remember today and our ability to heed anything we've heard in in any of these last weeks in Scripture, and we've still got two more to go, but we're going to do something a little unique this morning to really understand what it is we're doing today, why it matters, and how is it supposed to apply? How should we walk away, how should we walk into taking the Lord's Supper, and how should we walk away from that this morning? And so, Uh, We're going to bounce. I'm going to give you a lot of references in Scripture. We're going to have a good number of them on the screens to follow along. Uh, But I want you to see this, and and ultimately it'll come full circle as we get to the end. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me first to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to pick up in verse 23 as Paul talks about specifically the Lord's Supper. Here's what he says. For this for, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here's what he says, in in, in hearkening back to to Matthew chapter 26, Luke chapter 22, John chapter 13, these these pictures, he he says, the, the night Jesus was betrayed, that last night before the cross, Jesus is there with his disciples in the upper room they're having that final, that final meal together, and Jesus takes some bread. He, he breaks it and tells them, this bread symbolizes my body, my actual body, which is about to be broken, or, or Isaiah 52 would say beaten beyond recognition. It is to be broken on your behalf. And then he takes a cup, and, and, and he takes a drink, and he says, this cup represents my blood, which establishes not the old covenant, but a new covenant, And this is my blood which I have shed for you. And he says, as often as you partake of this, you do this not just in remembrance of what I've, you do this in remembrance of me. And then he tells them, if you go to those narratives, he says, I will not take, 
He says, I've eagerly, de I've desired to have this meal with you. It, it, for the joy set before Jesus, he broke his body and shed his blood. I have desired this, but I won't take part in this meal again until I return. But you, as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Do this, allow this time whenever in the life of the church, in the early church, the early, early church, they would do this uh, multiple nights, if not every night of the week. It says, as you come to the Lord's Supper, do this remembering me, remembering what I've done. And so Paul reminds them and says, here's the basis for the Lord's Supper, here's the, the, what we're doing today, we're remembering, and he, then he gives a warning. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in, of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus, but, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. Here's what Paul tells us. Paul tells us, he says, you need to know and be warned Lest you come and, 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 and engaging in this time of remembrance, you do so not unworthy. Listen, you'll see in a moment, we're all unworthy. None of us are worthy of what we're remembering. But he doesn't say unworthy. He says don't take it in an unworthy manner, meaning those of us who've been given Christ's worthiness, who've been saved by grace through faith, we're not to come in a way where we are allowing other things to tarnish and way down, we are allowing sin and other things, idolatry, to control us where we take of this in a way that's not truly reflective of Jesus. And so what Paul tells us to do, here's this warning, he says, examine yourselves. So what we're going to do this morning is walk through Scripture and allow Scripture to examine ourselves as we remember what it is that we come to the table to remember this morning. Now, to do that, you've got to start with the way that things were meant to be and versus the way things are. The way things were meant to be. Colossians 1.16 says this, For by Jesus all things were created, both in the heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. And we know that when Jesus created all things, part of, part of that creation, there was a pinnacle creature. And all that was seen and all that's part of the unseen supernatural realm, there was a pinnacle creature that alone was made in the image of God that had the ability to possess a unique fellowship and relationship with God. And that creature is humankind. You and I were made, quite literally, by Jesus we were made for Jesus, not for ourselves, and we were made to be in a relationship with God himself that satisfies and fulfills every last longing and desire in the human being. Elsewhere in Scripture, in, in Ecclesiastes, God will say he has made everything appropriate in time. He has set eternity on our hearts. There is a longing as, as beings made in the image of God for what was meant to be, to sit at the table of fellowship with God and to be in a peaceful, loving, right relationship where the fellowship is fuel, full, pure, rich, satisfying. But Romans chapter one tells us that, that this, this reality, though God has left aspects of his divine character in nature, though, though in our hearts we know that God is God and we were made for Him, it says that all of us by our sinful nature actively suppress and push down that knowledge through our unrighteousness, through our sin. See, here's the problem. The way things were meant to be is not the way things are because we are fallen. The reality of sin, Romans 3 says, verse 10, there is no one who is righteous, no one, not even one measures up. There is no one who understands, there's no one who seeks after God. And a few verses later in Romans 3, 23, it says, for all, every single man, woman, boy, and girl has fallen short and missed the mark of the glory of God. You see, there's a problem. By our sin, we have fallen short of being in relationship with God. Elsewhere, Scripture describes, describes that falling short, the fact that we are by nature sinners, describes it in language of, 
of a stain, Isaiah 64, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our human-produced righteous deeds are like filthy rags next to the righteousness of Jesus. See, righteousness language speaks of something that measures up. We've fallen short. The best, you can put it all in, come from the most religious family legacy. You can sprinkle and immerse yourself a million times over. You can teach a million classes. You can recite a million Bible verses. You can feed a million souls who are hungry. You can line up and stack the list of righteous deeds. And it says, at your very best in your righteous deeds. That's not my phone, but something is going off back here. What is that? That's a horrible moment for that to happen. There was something, I don't know if you all heard it, but there's a massive jingle going off back there and that was just kind of weird. Okay. You and I, if we commit the rest of eternity to doing nothing but righteous deeds, Scripture says that those righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Now, let me, let me give you a modern day lingo for filthy rags that actually falls short of the intensity of the original Hebrew, but it would be a little bit inappropriate uh, in this room. To say it's like filthy rags is to say that an eternity worth of our best, most righteous deeds is like soiled toilet paper compared to God's glory. It says that we are, even in our best righteousness, so dirty we fall short. Not only that, but it'll put the nail in the coffin here. Ephesians chapter 2, you can look up on the screens or follow with me. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Here's what it takes us. We've not just fallen short. We're not simply just so on righteousness that we, we have a stain beyond repair. Here's what it says. It says we're dead. And we're not just dead, but we're dead. We're literally strapped down. What kills us, what keeps us in a state of death is our own sin and unrighteousness. Now, let me help, uh, let me help visualize this for a moment because I want to make sure we understand the helplessness of what Scripture just said. Uh, I did give him a heads up, but I'm going to ask Chris Garza to come up and help me with something. Chris is one of our young adults in church. Uh, godly young man. We're grateful for him. And here's all I want you to do, Chris. I want you to sit right here. I've tried to think through how you can all see. Now, I know he's sitting, but you're going to imagine with me, uh, Chris, what I need you to do is I need you to, number one, I need you to pull off the best acting job ever of being dead. Okay? That's all I need you to do is just be dead. Now, I'm, now you can respond to me verbally, but, but you're dead, okay? Now, you're dead. You were made to sit at this table, Chris, in fellowship with God. Come sit. By the way, to, to the, the, the price of admission to get in is perfect righteousness that you've fallen short of. So I need you to get up and do a bunch of work to try to measure up. Oh, and by the way, when you do that work, you've got to make sure to scrub yourself clean. So, so, so if you could scrub yourself clean. No, no, you can't scrub yourself clean. You're dead, remember? You're dead. You can do nothing. Now, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm glad we can all laugh, and, I, and, and this is good, my, my, but my intention is I want you to see visibly, do you realize the utter helplessness of what Scripture just described? There is not a thing Chris can do to move himself up off the ground of sin and death to come and find life at the table of the king. He can do nothing. Not only that, 
But you notice it says dead in our trespasses and sins. Well, trespasses implies that we're not just dead, but it, we're dead because we've violated what is right. He's not just dead, but if you could imagine with me, Chris is chained to the floor, he is held captive in bondage by sin, and he has to pay the price of crossing the righteousness of God. His predicament is absolutely hopeless by every human standard. It doesn't matter how much water we sprinkle on his forehead, it doesn't matter how many times we dunk him in a baptistry. It doesn't matter who his family is or isn't. It doesn't matter how many Sunday school lessons he's attended. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses and Awanas he can recite. None of it matters because he's dead. So what's, what's going to happen? Because not only that, realize, we can all laugh at Chris doing a great job being a dead man, but scripture says every one of us are, are dead with him. And there's not another one of us that can help each other out. But scripture says, look at verse four, but God, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. He'll say in Galatians chapter four, in the fullness of time, he would send his one and only unique son, the one who is fully God and fully man, who would come and live the life that Chris can't live, that Chris has by nature failed to live. Jesus lives a life of complete and total righteousness. Jesus goes on a cross, pays the price that Chris rightfully deserves to pay, the price that Chris right now is gonna have to pay. And there comes a point where according to scripture, the Holy Spirit of God comes and, and begins to convict Chris. Chris, you're dead. Chris, you, your righteousness is like filthy rags. The righteousness you're trusting in to be good with God one day, God, I've done a lot of good stuff. That righteousness is like filthy rags. Chris. You've fallen short, but there is one who came on your behalf to take your place, who has not fallen short, but has met the standard, who has paid the price. His name is Jesus. He is Lord. He is King. He is the one who made you. He is the one for whom you, you were made for. There is no life and satisfaction outside of him. And as the Holy Spirit begins to convict Chris's heart, there is an offer of salvation. Jesus comes and says, Chris, in my grace, you've not done anything to earn it. And even, even if you accept it, you'll never still deserve it or earn it. You'll never pay me back. But I will take your place because I already have on the cross. And I will apply what I did on the cross to you. And when I apply it to you, I will take the keys of life and death that I have and I will break those locks and pull those chains off. I will send the Holy Spirit of God who breathes life. He will come and enter into, he will raise you to walk in newness of life. Not only that, but I will carry you into the kingdom of my, of my, of my Father. I will be the seat that you sit in and on at the table and I will save you. Chris can't do anything. Chris just has to simply say, do you trust Jesus to do it or not? And if he trusts, here's what happens. Jesus brings him, fills him with life forever, and seats him. That's the only hope Chris has. All right, you can go sit down. That's the only hope Chris has, is for someone else to come and do what he cannot do because his situation is absolutely hopeless. Well, you say, Pastor, how? How is it possible? How is it possible that, that those who are dead could be made alive and right? Well, listen to what Scripture says. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So the only way for Chris to be forgiven to be brought back for his trespasses and sins to be taken away and brought back. There has to be the shedding of blood. It's that serious. But Hebrews will go on to say in chapter 10, verses three through four, for it is impossible by the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So here's the problem. Blood has to be shed, but there's no blood in this world that can remove the sins. 
So listen to what Hebrews 9 says. But when Jesus appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, it's not of this earth, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if by the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a cow, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of flesh, how much more the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. To cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It says later on in the next chapter, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But Jesus, having offered this one sacrifice for sins for all time, set down at the right hand of God because his work was finished. Amen. You see, here's the reality. For a dead man, for a dead person, for, for, for any one of us dead in trespasses and sins, filthy in our own righteousness and unrighteousness, fallen short of the glory of God. Which, by the way, who is the perfect expression of the glory of God? Jesus. We've fallen short of Jesus, and Jesus came and took our place, and he shed his blood, and his blood's not like our blood. It's not like the blood of anything in creation. It's perfect blood. It's the blood of one who's fully God and fully man. Well, why did he shed it? 1 John 4, by this the love of God was made clear in us that God sent his one and only unique, one-of-a-kind son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that while we were dead we loved God, we didn't, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the atoning sacrifice, to be the one who shed his blood to make the payment. There had to be a payment made to rescue us from death. We were on death row Guilty is charged in our sin. There had to be a payment made. It's not just that he shed his blood. It's that he shed his blood so we could take his blood and make the payment once for all, forever, when applied to your account and mine. Why? Because for some wild reason, God really does mean it when he says he loves you. How is this applied? Here's, we see the reality of sin. We see the reality of, of, of shed blood. Blood has to be shed. It has to be a perfect blood. When Jesus' blood is perfect, it pays the price. Well, how is it brought into my life? Well, go back. Maybe you're still there in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so no one may boast. There's only one way the blood of Jesus gets applied to your account or mine. It's not through works, it's not through family lineage, it's not through, go on down the line, there's one way and one way alone. It's a response of faith. And the faith is not necessarily what saves, it's God's grace that saves us. It's our faith which is a simple reception of the gift. You say, well, what is faith? Well, faith is confidently placing the weight of the, your, the entirety of your being on someone else to represent you and to do the work for you. All of you are exercising a kind of faith sitting on the pew. Not one of you in this room is doing anything with your body to, to, to resist the forces of gravity. That pew's doing all the work for you. Now the difference would be if you didn't see that pew, you just knew it was there because God said it was there and you chose to sit down and allow it to do all the work for you. You're not doing anything. He's doing all the work for you. But you're taking him at his word. There is only one way. It's by grace through faith. It's a response to the Holy Spirit's conviction. It's a response that banks everything on who Jesus says he is and what he says he does. It's a response of repentance and faith to receive Jesus' gracious offer of salvation. And when it's received, at that moment, when you cry out and say, Jesus, you are in fact who you say you are. I am in fact in the hopeless plight you say I am. And I realize you and you alone can fix the problem. And I am crying out, I need you to save me. 
so that I can be reconciled to a right relationship with you. When that happens, Jesus takes the blood he's already shed and he washes my stain clean. He unshackles my chain. The Holy Spirit enters in me, regenerates me, makes me anew. It's not just that he brings a dead man back to life. It's that he, he throws away the dead man forever and makes me new forevermore. And then Jesus sits me in him, and all of a sudden I no longer fall short, not because I measure up, but because I am now clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and Christ measures It's received by grace through faith, and there's all kind of implications. When you and I are washed in the blood, my list here is, is not even remotely an exhaustive list, but we need to understand what it is we celebrate. We're given purpose for life. Look back, Ephesians 2.10. For we are Jesus' workmanship, God's workmanship, his artistic masterpiece is the sense of the word. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we would walk in them. We've been given purpose to walk. God, God, once I've been brought to life, I'm not just brought to life to kick back, but I now have a purpose. There's a plan. There is God's will for my life in this world and then into eternity. My life matters. God wants to do something in and through it. Not only this, Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five verse, verse one says this. In light, of, in light of this salvation that is by grace through faith, we have been justified, made right with God through faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the blood's applied to my account, I now have peace with God. It's relational speaking. There's no more friction between God and me from a relationship standpoint. I'm at peace. If I'm in Christ, you have peace with God. Amen. Now sin and idolatry that creeps in and tempts us to get distracted, it may interrupt our fellowship with God, but it never removes our peace with God. Not only that, but as a result of this peace, it says we've obtained this introduction by faith into this grace which we stand. We exult in hope to the glory of God. Not only this, we exult in tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, and hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to, this, to us. As a result of our peace with God, we now have hope. And that hope only grows more and more as we face hardship and suffering in a broken world where we are guaranteed to face hardship and suffering. We have peace. We have hope. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that because Jesus now is our great high priest, his blood applied to our account, that, that we can run with boldness and confidence to the throne of grace, that far from listening to the lies of the enemy which says, well, you don't measure up. God, God's not satisfied with how crazy your life has been. You haven't had enough quiet times. You haven't, you should have been, all this stuff that says, don't you dare run to your father boldly. If you're in Christ, you throw it all off. Listen, I don't measure up. I may have been walking well or walking poorly, but because I am in Christ, I have the right as a son or daughter to run with boldness and confidence into the throne room of my Father to find grace and mercy in time of need. In time of need when I'm struggling with temptation, in time of need when I'm facing hardship, in time of need when I'm facing prosperity, grace and mercy in time of need because I'm in Christ, washed with the blood. It says in Isaiah 1, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. It says in 1 Peter, knowing we weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb. We've seen it on Wednesday nights in Revelation 7. Who is this great multitude clothed in white? They are those that took their robes down to the, the blood of the lamb and they washed their robes and were made white. Listen, the reality is, by nature, we are sinners, so we sin, and our sin stains us. But hear me clearly, brother and sister in Christ. If you are in Christ, his blood washes you clean. 
you are no longer identified on the basis of stain, but on the basis of his glory and righteousness. And if you don't know Christ, and you say, I I, I fully am aware of the stains in my life, understand there is a hope for you today, an offer of cleansing, of washing white as snow. The shed blood of Jesus, I read it earlier, but turn with me, Revelation 5. The shed blood of Jesus, it is to produce in us an absolute awe and amazement and worship. What does this table mean today? It means we recenter. Is Jesus the full object of our worship? Here's the scene. Chapters four and five is in heaven. There's this, this grandeur of, of angels as they are worshiping Jesus. And it's when Jesus steps up, the only one in all creation who could break the seals And they say, worthy are you to to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, every people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to God. And then you drop down, it says, verse 11, I looked, I heard the voice of uh, more angels than could be counted around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the number of them was myriad, myriad, thousands of thousands, as the supernatural beings that are in heaven hear the cry of those who've been saved by the grace of God through the shed blood of Jesus, when they hear the cry of that, they all fall down. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne, to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. It says in chapter seven, those who are saved, we cry out salvation to our God who sits on the throne and all those supernatural beings fall to their faces in worship of Jesus. What does it mean if we've been washed in the blood of Jesus? What are we remembering today? We're not just remembering something that that, that in in, in our, In our time in this world, we are tempted to go, wow, look, Jesus shed his blood. Look at all the stuff I get. Yes, it's unbelievable what all we get. But make no mistake, to rightly understand, if we rightly understand what it means, what Jesus shed blood means for me, what it should produce is prostrated worship. Because that's what it produces in heaven. As we remember today, it should drive us to be in an awe and amazement and wonder of Jesus. It should lead us to shed the the ways we we make it all self-centered, a proper understanding of who He is, the Lamb of God. And what He's done, shed His blood, should leave us in the only possible posture left, surrender, which is called worship. Not just through song, but with our lives. It means as we come to to the table, we... We allow ourselves to be examined and we die to our will and our agenda. We die to our preferences and our ways. We reconsecrate ourselves before him because he alone is worthy. Now, flip with me one more place before we come to our invitation. Because there's another aspect. I told you we're walking through this series in the first part of Revelation. To him who overcomes. You and I living, those, those letters to the seven churches, they come alive to us because they, they show all sorts of realities into our world. We live in a world where, where, where there is every day temptation to compromise and capitulate the word of God. We live in a world where there is growing and growing hostility to the people of God and the things of God. We, we live in a world where to follow Jesus truly at his word costs. We live in a world filled with fears and worries. We live in a world filled with injustice and crooked leaders. We live in a hard world, hence the call to overcome. We live in a world that can be absolutely overwhelming to just try to formulate our thoughts to pray. And in this world, we're called to overcome. And listen, Revelation chapter 12 says, I heard a loud voice, verse 10. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. By the way, that's Satan, the most powerful evil force in our world. For the accuser of the brethren is thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night, and they, meaning the saints, those who have been saved by grace through faith, and they 
overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Church family, what we remember in remembering that Jesus shed his blood is not just remembering how Jesus brings us into a right relationship with God. It is the shed blood of Jesus that is the strength and guarantee that we will overcome. We will overcome. In the midst of all of this, there can be hope, strength, and resilience for those of us in Christ because of the shed blood of Jesus. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's the objective way we overcome through the word of our testimony, meaning as we walk in trust and faith, the blood of the Lamb, church family, this is what we remember today. And this, as I I move us into our time of invitation, this is what we must allow the Holy Spirit to examine us. Are we still living under condemnation or the freedom that is in the blood if I'm in Christ? Is there ways I'm living in willful disobedience? Are my affections for Christ in proper alignment? Am I confident in my position in Christ and walking in confidence with Him? Am I trusting in the blood? Does my worship focus on, on Him exclusively? Does my life reflect His purposes and agenda? Do, do hope, peace, and love mark my heart and mind? Am I overcoming or am I sinking? All of these are questions we can ponder as we allow the Lord to examine ourselves so that as we come today, we truly remember who He is and what He's done because we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to You now in this time of invitation. All of this, Lord, how we sing to you, how we speak about you, how we talk about you, how we live our lives, Lord, how we respond, all of it is a a part of what worship is. So Jesus, you know where our heart's at. May you be worshiped by our response. It is in your name I pray, amen.